To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms. Hello everybody and welcome to a podcast of Biblical Proportions. Episode 6, Cain and Abel, the oldest conflict in the book. The tale of Cain and Hevel, better known as Cain and Abel, is yet another iconic and archetypical Bible story known far and wide. In our popular memory, it is the first murder, the first fratricide, symbolizing the timeless family trait of competition between brothers for their father's attention. This universal theme has made this 3,000-year-old concise and simple story, only 187 words long, still relevant today. As usual, we're going to dive into the world of the people who wrote or listened to this story to see what we can come up with. Hi, Omri. Hi. How are you doing? Okay. So, you know, the first distinction maybe for me in this story is unrelated to Cain and Abel, but this is the first story so far that we've read that there's no God, God's Elohim, or God Yahweh, just straight up Yahweh. Mm -hmm. The standalone deity of the people who wrote and edited the whole book. The most prominent and obvious theme of this story is the fact that you have two brothers and they hold a different... Um, mm-hmm. Jobs. Different <laughs> jobs in society. One professions. Is <laughs> professions. One is a herder and one is a... Yeah, works uh, works, the, works land. the land. And the, their names, Cain and Hevel or Abel or Qain, Abel, <laughs> or whatever, how do you want to uh, imagine their accent again? Mm-hmm. It's a more southern name. Hevel? Hevel Abel? The name Hevel or Abel or Abel or Abel, it has the same root as an ancient Arabic word, uh, which means herdsman. Mm. So it's a clear archetype of a herder like Adam, a clear ar- archetype of man. Man, exactly. And kind, the same. It has the same root as an ancient southern Arabic uh, word that means metalsmith. Uh. So it's no coincidence that we see only Yahweh here. If you follow this trail of thought, it's obviously a southern story. The ancient Israelites, even in the Bible story itself, they are separated into two groups, the northern group and the southern group. The southern group is where Jerusalem is. The northern group is where Chatzor is, is uh, another famous city. Chatzor? Yeah. I think it's Chatzor. <laughs> Chatzor. <laughs> Hazor. Hazor. Uh, in the story itself, there was only one period, the King Solomon period, and like a few years after that, that all of this place was united. The northern and the southern kingdom. Even that is dis- disputed. And it's kind of disputed. So there's two clear voices out of the Bible, and the voice that tell this story is the southern voice that comes which, from the Bible. Which was less settled which than was the northern side. So they exactly. are Hevel and Cain mm-hmm. is the archetypical northern. Mm-hmm. And the archetypical northern kills the archetypical uh, southern. Mm-hmm. Oof. So I guess they, uh, it's even more than they had some leverage. Yahweh likes the southern, the southern more. He likes yes. his offering more. That's yes. why Cain is jealous and that's why he murders him so for the audience this story is very familiar yes it's not familiar because they can recognize the family themes of a envious brother and a brother's quarrel and also this is a very short story this is a very short story they they have to put in all their cultural uh, baggage into the story it's it's, it's it's half a word document similar uh, stories about conflicts between uh, nomadic shepherds and settled farmers appear in uh, sumerian stories in babylonian Mm -hmm. stories so this is something that is very relevant to their society and you know what you can uh, you can see that even today uh, in in movies about city people going to live in the village mm-hmm. then you have this eternal conflict the village they're slower 
they're more authentic, mm -hmm. the city people, they are more uh, sophisticated, they know more, but they also... They're more soft also. More soft and snobbish, maybe. So this is the same, uh, the same kind of thing like that, that we instinctively, we recognize the differences between those two forms of, uh, of societies. This and, is... And this is the oldest conflict in the book. Since civilization arose, because back 20, 30,000 years back then, there were no civilization, only uh, hunter-gatherers. Nomadic cultures? That was the, nomadic cultures was the default of human society, mm -hmm. because your existence was nomadic. Uh, it's not exactly nomadic, you had like a 10,000 kilometer radius or something like that, meters radius that you no bad in it, <laughs> but when your resources were failing and uh, you need to find new grounds, then you were... Yes. Uh, yes. The nomadic way of life was the default, not the settled yes. way of life. And then it started to change. And here comes the tension. And it then became conservatism. <laughs> 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 no, the, it's, the, it's not only a tension between settled societies and the nomadic societies that sometimes do bad things to yeah. that settled society. They rob, they pillage, they raid, they, they raid, they pillage. It's not only that, it's the fact that the nomadic societies hold some kind of a, an original, mm -hmm. basic uh, essence of humanity. Of humanity, yes. of like old school, uh, not touched by times, by yes. fashions, like yes. something authentic, raw authentic, and authentic. Like the, like exactly. the village, uh, <laughs> village dwellers in, the, in today's movies. Exactly. I read a great book called The History of the Arabs. And even there, the author talks about this constant tension between the settled societies, I forgot the name, and the nomadic society. In, the, in Arabia. In Arabia. The desert. And the fact that the nomadic perceptions of the Arab, even though that throughout the history of Arabs there were nomadic people and settled people, there were more than two or three versions of being an Arab. The nomadic perception of the Arab with his camels, the Bedwa, that's the name. Hadar is the settled society, Bedwa it's the... Like Bedouin today. Like Bedouin today. People of the desert are considered more authentic, raw, uh, yeah, closer, Arab. closer to nature exactly yes yes so it's not only a conflict between the settled societies and the, the nomadic uh, cultures as you said it's also the fact that Yahweh the God the deity and also in the other Mesopotamian myth that you mentioned God favors the nomadic part so he uh, he likes uh, what uh, Hevel gives him Hevel he's the herder he likes the, the meat and the fat, the meat and the fat and the milk, but he doesn't like <laughs> the fruits of the land, the fruits of the land, the agriculture. And he doesn't even say why. He just like, no, didn't shut up, <laughs> didn't like it, just didn't like it. So even the authors tell the audience, God favors the original part, favors your more uh, untouched by civilization, by the moral deprivation that civilization Boom. brings. Boom. And that feeling of the bigger your civilization is, your society, your culture, the more it becomes, it becomes bigger, mm -hmm. the moral deprivation of that uh, society becomes yes. bigger as well. Yes, and you dilute so the essence of the culture because it becomes more cosmopolitan, and if it's bigger, then you... you, you you put in uh, more kinds of people into your empires, so you lose mm -hmm. something. You lose something like your original sense. Yes, this is like essence. Brexit. This is like Brexit. No, we want to go back to being our own British self, whatever the fuck that means. Or actually, it's more like how the Romans viewed themselves as the civilization, the decadent civilization that is getting softer vis-a-vis -vis those uh, Germans uh, slash Gauls slash uh, Celts, Picts, whatever it is, the closer, you, the closer you are to nature, the truer you are to how humans are, and the more ferocious you are. 
uh, to your point about uh, Hevel, Hubble. So look at the punctuation. The first time they say they mention the Hevel's name, it's punctuated Havel. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. His brother Havel, mm -hmm. and then and then it says Hevel right there. And Hevel was so it, it, it's both Havel and Hevel. Okay. I think it's something that was repeated in the in, in the Bible, like the Lamech became Zlemech, but uh, the word ha Havel it's more similar to the original word Abel Abel, which was herdsman. So some say that this is a story that the characters, because of their names and because this is a kind of a reclamation of well-told stories in the area, that they are symbolic characters. But I don't buy it. <laughs> don't buy it? No, because I think that back then when the editors imagined the uh, prehistory and they didn't consider it as prehistory, but history, the beginning, the genesis, it was a missing plot, it was a plot hole to be filled. There is a clear hierarchy in their culture yes. of the people who listen to this story. Power and roles, gender roles and roles in society. So there's a burning question of how we got here that some people are herdsmen and some people work the land because it, they, it, this, is the more, this is the most basic professions and, and we will see later we will see later in the later in the next episode we will see actual professions being mm -hmm. created it's kind of an explanation of hierarchies we need to answer the question of how we got here in terms of some people do this and some people mm -hmm. do this and to that also the nomadic people they see the the settled societies doing better they're richer they are more powerful so, okay, that yeah. might be true, but Yahweh, mm -hmm. he liked my shit better than he liked yours. We are more moral. We are more moral. So here in the story, being concise as it is, the English version has more than double the words. 396 words versus 187 with all the hath and the art. <laughs> thou shall. And thou shall be and all that. This is just becomes a totally different story. But they did a good job in the translation here in one of the most famous uh, phrases uh, in Hebrew in the Bible, Hashomer Achianochi, translated to Am I my brother's keeper? An iconic sentence, and we, and we saw in the previous episodes that they didn't do uh, that good a job with, uh, with, the, translating, English. Uh, yeah, with the English translation uh, that uh, has lost his uh, iconicism, whatever it is. And there's another one, uh, another uh, phrase that we now use. Someone who is sad, his face has fallen. Lama <laughs> naflu <laughs> okay. His countenance fell. His nah. countenance, yeah. Nah. Lame. Lame. <laughs> and another thing in the translation, they have a chance to correct the grammar because there is a problem in the way that they describe uh, the murder. In Hebrew, it says, said Cain to uh, Hevel's brother as they were in the field, Cain came to his brother and murdered him. Okay, what did he say? It starts with said. So in the English translation, they just uh, fudge it up. And they say, uh, when Cain talked uh, with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up, uh, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. <laughs> slew him. He just kills him, actually. Didn't, didn't really slay him. Uh, uh, when Yahweh asks uh, K uh, Kain, where is your brother? This is again the same Yahweh from the previous episode. Who says, the where interrogator are, uh, of Yahweh. Yeah, yeah. Where, are, uh, where are you? Also interrogator, uh, interrogator, and also he doesn't know everything. He doesn't know everything. He, he realizes uh, what has happened because he has the superpower. And then again, the punishment is the same punishment that we saw last time is that Working the land is going to be very, very, very tough. The land will not give you its power mm -hmm. anymore. And then he sends him to be a nomad. How, you, how do you square that? Navanad in mm -hmm. Hebrew is very nice. Navanad, yeah, Navanad. going here and there. Uh, so the punishment for, uh, for, for someone who does agriculture is to become a nomad. I guess he doesn't have uh, the skills 
to make that work <laughs> or something maybe that's the thing or not uh, maybe it's some kind of a um, excommunication not in the Christian sense mm. but uh, when someone is instead of killing him and some somebody from the tribe does a really bad thing the the most powerful punishment you can give him is yes. being uh, excommunicated from the tribe yes. and being shunned by your peers. Yes, you have no protection, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And here, God gave him the mark of Cain, so people will know not to kill him. <laughs> yes, because he whines about his punishment that the people...